Good morning to you all. So we were in the dark and now we are under the spotlight, particularly this one here. And uh, today we have three papers in principle. So I say in principle because Dr. Uh, Ricard Jilali is going to intervene using uh, Zoom, but we still uh, we're still suffering from some technical problems uh, in terms of the connection. But anyway, he is the third uh, panelist to intervene, so we still have some time. So the uh, two panelists uh, we have with us, uh, Dr. Muhammad Al Naimi and Dr. Qais. Uh, Tria. So we will start with Dr. Muhammad Al Naimi first, and his paper is entitled Understanding the Ultras Movement in Morocco. Very briefly, I'll be presenting uh, Dr. Al Naimi. He is a professor of organizational sociology at the Institute for Social Development in Rabat. Morocco. He earned his PhD in political science from Université Mohamed V. He is a researcher at the Centre d'études et de recherche en sciences sociales and a member of the Marsad America Latina Working Group. His research interests revolve around social movement in Morocco and the role in democratic transition in the Arab world and Latin America. And you know that uh, democratic transition actually started being uh, tackled in Latin America. His most recent publications include a January 2020 study titled The Limitations of Rational Choice Theory in the Sociology of Social Movements, the Cases of the February 20 and Hirakri Movements. So it was published in Omran magazine in January 2020. You have uh, 20 minutes, uh, doctor, and then we will negotiate. Uh, and uh, it depends uh, on the strength of uh, each one of us. So we have three minutes of negotiations. Thank you, uh, Mr. Muldi, for this presentation. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers of this uh, symposium, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies, particularly the Dirasat, Political Dirasat, and Omran um, magazine. So uh, my paper is entitled Understanding the Ultras Movement in Morocco. And it seems that uh, this second day will actually, in addition to what was mentioned by Dr. Uh, Muldi, so he mentioned moving from the dark to the light. It seems also that we will move from the uh, theory aspect to the practical aspect. This is why this paper is about a field research regarding the ultras movement in Morocco. What justifies this choice is and based on uh, the uh, Marcel Morisi as uh, the multi-dimensional sports phenomenon. It is that football as a collective sport allows us the possibility to enjoy with a dual uh, aspect. So the first source of enjoyment is relating to the game itself, football, and the other one is actually created by the ultras in the world particularly in the Arab world. Of course, here we can talk about the celebration that uh, is associated with football games. So 
this is the foundation of uh, my paper. I start with these questions. And the first question is, these, uh, this atmosphere created by the ultras, does it not create an opportunity and a justification for the use of political regimes, particularly authoritarian regimes, in order to use football as means, as the opium, the new opium of the people, as a new distraction, and also the football arena. Where, of course, uh, the security aspect is more difficult than the security aspect in the streets. Uh, so, uh, this, we have to talk about this. And the fans, especially ultras fans, are they not more free in the stadia? They can protest without being uh, monitored compared to other public spaces. In addition to that, if the ultras in the stadia are collectively a peaceful movement representing the identity of a certain group. How can we understand the behaviors, violent behavior, irrational behavior that actually disturb and distort this movement? So, in order to answer these questions, the uh, research, the field research, was based on the following hypotheses. First of all, football is a double-edged sword. It is a public space, and it should uh, uh, follow the same uh, rule when it comes to monitoring and political use. At the same time, it could be a space for free expression of concerns and political and social demands just like protests in the street. And also, the research supposes that uh, the violent movements sometimes seen in the ultras uh, areas is the result of the interaction between the security forces and the members of the ultras. The new wave of the ultras protests to include some violent forms may be uh, the uh, reaction of the fact that the authorities prevented them in 2016. And then uh, what happened in 2018 actually says that we could witness, witness a deep transition when it comes to the uh, protest. As to the methodology uh, used, it is an attempt to understand. So this is why the researchers use direct observation and observation with participation, especially. Uh, but there are some risks to it, especially when uh, the researcher uses the space dedicated to the fans. Of course, there's a difficulty when it comes to the access. So this is actually regarding the methodology and also the interviews that are deep interviews and also some life uh, uh, stories about the uh, or told by the experts. Also, this research tried to uh, use the digital archive left by the ultras, particularly on platforms such as Facebook and YouTube. Of course, without uh, pretending to be uh, complete, but this brief research from April to June, so three months, in that included 20 interviews that were very difficult to get because many activists and many ultras actually have reservations when it comes to 
uh, talking to the media. So they are anti-media. This is how they define themselves. So it is difficult for any researcher to convince them of uh, the difference between newspapers and the research and the papers. And uh, the researchers was capable, or the researcher was capable of overcoming some of these difficulties through the use of some colleagues and researchers and also some relatives uh, who facilitated access to this arena. Also, uh, when it comes to the methodology, we have to take into account the different locations of ultras in Morocco. Uh, so it included Rabat and Casablanca, uh, so we did Andraja, and to the north, there's the ultras movement uh, in Tetuan and Tanja. Tanja. When it comes to the uh, theoretical aspect, it was based on uh, criticism of Gustave Le Bon when it comes to the psychology of the fans. Gustave Le Bon, in his very famous book, talks uh, about uh, the uh, masses. Uh, so the fact that they are totally subject to a driver. So with a very small sign by the leader of this uh, orchestra, he, the masses follow and it's as if the uh, masses are subject to a collective consci consciousness and following this driver. Lilian Mathieu as well he has an approach based on the uh, tradition particularly sociology and uh, the uh, sociology approach of uh, Mathieu is different than the theory of Pierre Gourdieu because the latter, for him, is talking about uh, a closed space that has a set of uh, criteria and standards. But the social uh, domain is an open space and people who want to access this open space that they need a minimum of uh, skills in order for them to be capable of doing so so that's in general uh, what I have to say regarding the theory and the methodology so the structure of the paper is divided into four Parts. The first one was dedicated to highlight the most important challenges he had to face in his attempt to access the ultras circles. And the second part was briefly dedicated to highlight and try to highlight the conditions of the birth of the ultras globally at the Arab world level and also talking about uh, the ultras and what differentiates between them and the remaining fans. And the third aspect is dedicated to the political aspect of the ultras. And the paper concludes with the risks uh, slipping uh, towards violence for the ultras. So I will be very quickly uh, mentioning uh, the difficulties or the challenges. So I just have to say that at the beginning when I tried to call, call or contact some members of the ultras, the context actually was right after the latest incidents uh, in Rabat between uh, Jaish Malaki and uh, Tariq Maghrib and uh, the local team uh, witnessed the defeat and uh, there were riots, there were arrests, uh, 
among the uh, fans and there were injured people on both sides. I had some difficulties when it comes to this aspect. Some people, for instance, promised uh, me an interview, but uh, later on when I tried to contact them, they did not interact or react positively, and this actually reflects the concerns that the ultras have. And I can give you very briefly a brief uh, overview of what one of the ultras said in Titwan. He says, we notice uh, the weakness of the legal text of course, when it comes to uh, the uh, law in Morocco, as opposed to the uh, reports of judiciary police, this, these reports could transform or could portray the uh, uh, fans as uh, bugubu. So this uh, actually could become a direct recognition, implicit recognition of my role as a leader of this group and my involvement or implication in the uh, protests that do not are not uh, certified and licensed. This is why this activist and uh, several of them decided to remain anonymous because they were afraid of uh, being held responsible. So this was just one specimen of the difficulties that I faced. When it comes to the birth of the ultras movement, Sebastian Louis says that the birth of the ultras movement is linked with Italy 1968 in particular. In the Arab world, the first appearance was in Tunisia in 2000 with the African winners affiliated with the African club and uh, then Esperanza. In Morocco, the birth was in 2005. Of course, there's a debate uh, uh, between the two aspects of the uh, ultras, so the Royal Army in Rabat and uh, the Raja of Casablanca, both actually claim to have uh, started first. So this is actually the detail regarding the appearance in Morocco in 2005. Later on, the ultras movement uh, was or became widespread, so observers estimate the numbers of at uh, 50, and uh, I do not remember who in Egypt uh, wrote and said, but he said that in Morocco, there's the biggest number of uh, ultras in the Arab world. So the question could arise, why this uh, widespread and interesting widespread of ultras in Morocco and why this passion uh, for uh, football uh, sports in Morocco particularly. I have uh, hypotheses that uh, I will be working on in the future maybe and it is actually linked with what will be highlighted in the second part which is the use of authoritarian regimes of football as means to distract the masses and to embellish the outside image. So I suppose that in Morocco, particularly during uh, the reign of Al-Hassan II, the general policy was to encourage football and the streets and the neighborhoods and the stadia with very important budgets. So we could say that football at a certain stage in the 70s and the 80s, so we could say, based on many observers' accounts, that football was indeed playing this role 
that actually is somehow similar to the role of the opium of the masses. I will quickly move to try to determine the concept or to define the concept of uh, ultras. Pascal Duré distinguished between four patterns. First of all, you have the fans who just watch, so the watchers. The second one is that the fans who are more involved. And then you have the ultras that have complete allegiance. And also the fourth uh, category is the English hooliganism. So the first uh, category, uh, watch the game. The second uh, category actually uh, believe that their support leads to the uh, winning of the games. The ultras are more organized than regular fans. During the week, they dedicate uh, more time and they defend their teams, but also they have their own chants, etc. And as opposed to these patterns, the hooligans believe that uh, the victory, regardless of the result of the game itself, is based on the confrontation with the uh, other fans of the other team and uh, occupying the stadium. I will move very quickly to the ultras and uh, the space of the stadia. So throughout years, particularly uh, in the 70s and the 80s, so the beginning of the 90s in Morocco, the regime used to abuse or use uh, football as some sort of opium or means to distract the masses. But later on, we noticed that uh, it actually backlashed, as we say, and the ultras movement now in Morocco has become a rebellious uh, movement that cannot be controlled, that cannot be surveilled and monitored. Um, ba this is based on some of the um, interviews that were very difficult to get with some members of the security apparatus and the judiciary. So some security officers told me that they tried repeatedly to sit down with the leaders of the ultras to coordinate with them. However, these attempts used to fail. And now ultras movement cannot be controlled and monitored. And I would like to conclude with the risks of slipping towards violence. Of course, uh, this does not only apply to Morocco, but it is also relevant for all Arab countries. We can distinguish between two general directions in this movement. Uh, so we have the Italian movement and the English movement. The Italian movement does not endorse violence. And this is what we see widespread in North African countries and many other countries. Hence, accusing uh, ultras of uh, sports violence. So when uh, I had these interviews, almost all the interviewees confirmed that they are against the violence and the fact that they were not responsible for these uh, uh, the violence and the riots they were responsible for the members so i would like to conclude two minutes just some outcomes that i have reached So here we can see the most important results. It seems that one of the most important results of this field research is that the field of football 
is indeed a double-edged sword because this research shows this video uh, this research shows that uh, this field is actually has the same uh, aspects applied just like any public space at the same time it could be an arena where freedom is guaranteed to express one's opinions also the violence and the right is actually the result of a misunderstanding and negative interaction between security um, agencies and some groups of the ultras there is a very uh, there are specificities when it comes to this interaction one of the witnesses uh, in march uh, 2020 in uh, rabat so he told me that uh, the uh, driver behind these uh, events was that one of the fans threw a flare on uh, the pitch and one of the security forces took it and threw it back to the fans which is something that resulted in what happened so this was a very simple example about some unexpected things that could happen during these interactions and here I can uh, talk about Kaufman and who said that what happened during the interaction it is difficult to predict and expect so maybe we will have enough time to discuss this paper thank you so much for allowing this opportunity thank you so much dr muhammad naimi so you are right on time now dr kais treya i will be telling you an anecdote which is that he was one of my old students i had forgotten about him the first time i saw him here i asked him is it you he said yes i hadn't seen him for 20 years so i learned two lessons one is that i am getting old really old and the second is that majd abu amr on a daily basis he says that uh, I uh, have. Uh, I can no longer recall the events. Actually, he is right. So, Kaistrea will present a paper about sports stadiums, sorry, ultras groups in Tunisia, the intersections of sports, politics, and religion. Very interesting uh, topic. So, Kais is a researcher for the laboratory Philab of Cultures, Technologies and Philosophical Approaches, University of Tunis. He holds a PhD in Sociology from the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the same university. He is member of the Tunisian uh, Sociological Association and the International Association of Francophone Sociologists. His research concerns the sociology of communication and media and sociology of sports. His recent publications include the Tunisian Press at the time of transition, 2010-2011, a semiotic sociological reading of Tunisian newspaper editorials. It was published in the Algerian Journal of Mass Media and Public Opinion Research December 2021. The floor is yours, my dear colleague. Thank you, Mr. Muldit. Thank you uh, for all for being here with us. Before beginning, uh, I would like to uh, thank 
the organizers of this symposium, in addition to the team of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. This intervention is actually a brief summary of a research paper entitled Ultras Groups in Tunisia, the Intersections of Sports, Politics and Religion. This uh, presentation is divided into four aspects, the theory and then the methodology, the outcomes and the uh, conclusion and research horizons. So the uh, main uh, bulk of this paper focuses on the fast-paced changes at the level of the Tunisian society when it comes to ultras and the relation with competing uh, uh, groups using this tracking we try to see the interactions and intersections between politics religion and uh, sociology so the ultras refuse the political use of uh, the uh, fans and they actually portray themselves as uh, supporting teams and specific teams, but deep down we know that they express some some demands. They refuse the uh, situation that they have to go through, and in Tunisia we see the development of uh, this expression and the cultural practices, particularly when it comes to the uh, movement from uh, support uh, to graffiti that could express the identity of the ultras. Al-Bash is actually a huge billboard that includes the symbol of the team and the name of the group. And we actually highlight us and them the ultras and the competing groups in order to see the uh, different implications of the revolution and how it affected the practices of ultras in the pitch or in the stadium and outside of the stadium so uh, in 2011 there was a rise of uh, salafi groups as competitors to the ultras that was the result of the expansion of poverty unemployment and politics used to play a major role in the economy that led to inequalities so in the form we saw some violence but deep down it was an expression of different sociological economic and political aspects so we discussed the fact that the ultras before the revolution in Tunisia used to represent the youth and the fact that the youth do not ha did not have uh, uh, any means to express their, their identity. But the rise of Salafi group as uh, competitors to the ultras and its human capital resulted in the expansion of the battle and the intersection with the religious aspect. Uh, the second uh, hypothesis is that uh, uh, the foundation of the uh, um, revolution led to new forms of uh, confrontation inside the stadia and outside. When it comes to the methodology, we talk about uh, the uh, unemployment and how it marginalized uh, the youth and uh, they, were, they were seeking other ways of recognition uh, to include belonging to ultras. So we are talking about uh, uh, the fact that there's violence by the ultras uh, against the security forces and the competing groups. The more the confrontation is uh, strong, the uh, symbolic capital of the ultras becomes better the, there's this concept of we and them us and them we uh, uh, were based on pierre bourdieu's uh, research moving in different uh, sociological aspects taking into account the tunisian specificity 
So we are talking about internal regulations and laws, particularly when it comes to arts, literature, and uh, we are talking about an elite that is closed and in this field the individuals compete in order to control different positions just like the chess game. Pierre Bourdieu uh, in his book uh, published in 1984 so talked about uh, the specific uh, definition of uh, sport the uh, aspect of amateur uh, as opposed to a professional sport and the elite and the masses. So this confrontation represents uh, a battle when it comes to the capital and positions. The objective is to strengthen the uh, symbolic capital of the group. And uh, we are talking about a uh, driver for the uh, uh, well, for what we see. So the identity evolves based on the experiences that it goes through. And also uh, every domain, like the political, religious, arts, each one of them has its own logic. And there's a confrontation between the different components of each domain. So the conflicts that were witnessed in Tunisia after 2011 at the different uh, political and religious levels was expanded to the sports field and this is where we witnessed new uh, confrontations. This is why the ultras uh, expressions uh, were highlighted with uh, implicit uh, uh, messages and we try to see how they interact with uh, political and religious and we focus on the sociological aspect in order to study the practices in certain specific social circles. We try to link between these symbols and the situations that result from them. We were based on the uh, semi-sociological uh, approach based on two levels. the field work based on observation and tracking the activities of ultras in 2007 in Bourguiba, Benzert, and northern parts of Tunisia and also the graffitis that are uh, spread in different spaces and that the, uh, through which the uh, movement proves its control. So we're talking about the city, the town, and also uh, this uh, confrontation uh, or also sorry the interview uh, or series of interviews with different uh, people belonging to different uh, ultras group and also an analysis of Asia Bay which is one song which is uh, uh, all of the security forces are um, bad and uh, another song that was analyzed. The result or the outcome of the uh, study. The ultras actually attracted several social groups, particularly the youth, the youth suffering from poverty, from unemployment, and the fact that they cannot access capital and the state actually controls them. So in Tunisia, before 2011 and after 2011, we can talk about this aspect in order to understand the dynamics between the ultras and the authority. This marginalization could be uh, determined uh, or defined as uh, unemployment, inequality, uh, lack of school enrollment. So this belonging to the ultras has become a social refuge that would give appreciation and recognition by the uh, uh, people. So uh, the uh, Bourguiba actually, uh, as the ultras uh, say, uh, could uh, summarize the battle that uh, these members of the uh, ultra do. So we can 
see the graffiti that actually is all over financial and economic institutions such as uh, banks and when it comes to the cultural capital we can talk about a reaction vis-a-vis -vis the social inequality and the division between public and private uh, sectors and also the uh, symbolic uh, capitalism struggle the widespread graffitis in al hay al homa and public spaces where different slogans are painted so based on the field uh, work we can determine three factors that led to the marginalization and the exacerbation of this marginalization so the different uh, parties try to uh, have the monopoly of power but we have 192 political parties competing and the authority was carrying out symbolic violence by trying to control sports and actually allowing games to happen but without fans particularly after the revolution in 2011 this resulted in marginalization of the ultras also the authorities uh, continue to use the same means when it comes to them dealing with the ultras so we can establish a parallelism with the era of ben ali and uh, we have also the addition of uh, the islamist uh, movement and the left so uh, we i have to be at two if the game is um, at uh, six and this interaction between uh, religious and uh, sport we are talking about power we are talking about control so the interaction between the religious and uh, the sports especially after the arrival of political uh, religious uh, parties and the mixture between uh, islamist uh, politics uh, and uh, the civil society on one hand and the caliph the believers and the citizens they have uh, used the revolution and we will uh, highlight the uh, fact that the rise of the salafi uh, movement and the implications when it comes to the ultras in addition to the relation between religion and sports in Tunisia. But before go doing so, we need to remind of two incidents. The first of all, the rise of the Salafi movements uh, after 2011 by controlling mosques and creating or founding political parties, a dawa, uh, parallel security, etc. So, and highlighting the outcomes of uh, this uh, of the study, Ahmad Maliti uh, asked a number of questions regarding the Salafi movement, representing a movement that tries to impose its role by force, and this ethical. Um, oversight role that uh, started in 2011 also the authority uh, in 2011 uh, imposed uh, the fact that games should be played without fans and uh, there were sanctions imposed on clubs and uh, stadia uh, was uh, shut down uh, for ultras uh, using a simple comparison between Salafi and ultras based on the outcomes of the uh, field work we can talk about the similarities and differences between the two what uh, attracts attention is the common denominators in the the presence of a common enemy and the background coming from shanty towns and the Salafis as representatives of uh, a very extremist religious trend and and the Shabab al-Hay or the youth of the district or where they live sometimes they share their common fears of uh, poverty and employment and the oppressive tactics of the, the of the police they by and large either know each other or they are related 
and for for this reason the banning of al ultras from entering into the stadiums created a defect in the dynamics the tifosi or a member of the ultras lost his space and under the pretext of combating violence and this made this means that the these groups of ultras lost the the ground and the tifosi a member of these youth groups and ultras started this youth started instead of attending ultras gatherings attending the tents that the salafis established to propagate the principles of religion or da'wah and they started adopting adopting the the principles of khilafah the truba was a person who belonged to the ultras then he became a member of the groups to protect the revolution and then later on he was known to be a prominent leader in the salafi movements and uh, as saqandah a well-known personality in morocco and the the ultras at that time went through a struggle against the salafis on the one hand and the state and its authorities and, and this created a happy choose so a space where where the religious has been intertwined with the ultras and using common symbolisms like traditional attire or a beacon on the one hand on the other uh, also in Tunis uh, there was some social phenomena that uh, the youth were uh, excluded, marginalized and uh, I'll take some groups like the Dodgers of 2007 and uh, the, their presence both inside and outside football stadiums and this has led to other groups appearing who were in competition with the ultras and they were drawing from the same pool of youth that the ultras was doing. Here the intersection between the religious and the sports and despite the difference in the objectives and the backgrounds and the different spaces both uh, groups were operating in yet what they have in common is that they both uh, are against the authority and they're trying to reformulate the social reality and here there is room for for uh, exploring more the interaction between religion and politics and what is noticeable in Tunis that uh, there is a strong return of the uh, ultras between and now uh, this poses a question of what is common between the leaders or symbols of ultras and the symbols of uh, the Salafis and new forms of struggle uh, appeared now and uh, this calls for more research into the social backgrounds and and uh, edward Evan evans fitchell the british uh, anthropologist uh, 
has did. In, in Arabic, it's said that I and my brother can stand against our cousins, but uh, I and my cousins can stand against the enemy, the outsiders. And uh, this is uh, similar to what happens in the tribal tradition when tribal members can fight each other, but uh, when there's a common enemy, they stand together to face up to that uh, enemy. For example, in Tunisia, we have Kirvasir Karvanal, which is the union of the northern groups and the southern groups. In, 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 in the northern parts, there are four or five groups who create a sort of a union and they all support one, one team. On the one hand, they can fight each other, yet when they face uh, the groups uh, who support uh, other teams, they unite against those. Thank you very much, Dr. Qaistrea, for your presentation. A clear presentation. And we will... Dr. Qad Jilali, we still cannot uh, establish contact over Zoom if, they can, if my, our colleagues in the social media, uh, uh, he is not available. So therefore, we have some room for the for the questions and answer. I think the two presentations provided us with uh, enough background and food for thought. So this is an opportunity for us to discuss them. I think the discussion will be heated. We open the floor now for you, ladies and gentlemen. Let me try and copy what my uh, my colleagues and thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't know why you keep calling me doctor. <laughs> Anyway, my question to, to Naimi, uh, so far as the violence aspect of uh, football supporters, you mentioned uh, in, in Italy, you said that the violence is not present. Um, compared to the ultras. In fact, uh, uh, physical violence may not be in, uh, present in, in Italy, yet verbal abuse and ultras groups in, in Italy engage in racism and other forms, not necessarily violent forms of uh, in Morocco, the supporters of Al Raja Al Widad, the aspect aspect of violence doesn't that uh, reduce uh, reduce it to just the physical violence? What if, what about uh, the racist remarks? What about uh, demeaning other social group? We know sometimes. Uh, for example, when a Casablanca team plays in Rabat or Tangier, we, you notice this kind of verbal abuse. Please state your name. because your name will be mentioned in the social media. Thank you. My name is Abdelrahim Gharib from Casablanca. 
uh, I, I want to share some information with my colleague Naimi. And Si Abdullahim Burqiya was a, a well known, well, he is a well known writer. He published a book uh, recently on the ultra um, in 2020. And uh, he, he wrote a nice book similar to Patrick Boucher. And uh, uh, we did a kind of a survey which took uh, into account a, a sample from 1,700 supporters from 12 cities. So we had 1,700 interviews. I used, I, 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 I used uh, 50 young men and women, their peers, because I thought if I went to them directly, they wouldn't give me or share any information with me. I'll give you some figures. Four out of ten of, uh, of troublemakers uh, belong to Altras. Two out of ten take hallucinating uh, drugs and uh, two out of ten went to to the stadium uh, to revenge themselves because they were subjected in the past to acts of violence or whatever. And the average age is 21, they are either unemployed or they are, their education level doesn't pass secondary and they, uh, they, they, uh, they, they wear the symbols and scarves representing the team. Eight out of eight percent, they are aware. Uh, they were aware of the law that bans such activities. Yet uh, they carry them on. Also, I, I dealt with this phenomenon in 2003 and 10 years later. In 2005, when, when this phenomenon started appearing, the, the age group was, for example, around 20 to 25. Ten years later, they are in their 30s or 40s, so they are married, they have children, so they are less reckless. So you see that uh, relatively speaking, you see them less likely to commit the acts they were uh, and also taking into account the policies employed by the state to face up to rioters and that also should be taken into account i'll give you an example also the minister of the interior spoke about disbanding the ultras and when when we use this kind of uh, solution, they, they, we are talking about the legal entities, but they don't have such a status. Thank you. We will, uh, we, we, we will be after you until you write as a paper to publish in Mahfouz uh, Amara from. Uh, uh, so far as the research into the phenomenon of the ultras, I think there is a lot of focus on the security side and the violence side. This is as if giving the authorities the excuse to deal with this uh, phenomenon on this basis only. Why? Why don't we fo look at it from a different point of view, from a more uh, 
uh, the, the, the element of uh, thinking outside the box type of thing. They have their own style, they sing, they dance, they do lots of things. Why can't we be creative as they are? Maybe we will change the epistemology and maybe hopefully in the future in our research we can focus on this aspect to the creative side and maybe this can change the stereotypes of these groups. Dr. Qais, when you talked about the intersection between the Salafis and the Ultras, maybe this is due to football itself. Football brings everyone together. And maybe some Islamic movements try to exploit uh, football for ideological and political reasons, similarly to other parties and uh, authorities to maybe football lends itself to this kind of activity and this appears almost normal even among Salafis are those who support football so this is this does not create any contradiction between their personalities who have a different reading of the of Islamism and supporting football maybe the maybe the salafi when when his national team wins he will feel the same kind of joy and excitement like any other supporter this is something peculiar to football which makes this kind of uh, overlapping normal thank you I uh, just want to activate the left side of the room. I agree with the question with this previous speaker. Uh, I noticed that uh, there is an attempt to link the ultras uh, uh, relationship with the state in a political, narrow political scope and not taking into account social and other aspects despite the importance and the social understanding there is another aspect and that is the nature of organization for these supporters are these legal entities and what are their relationships really with the clubs the, the problem in the arab world and most arab world the clubs uh, and also they vote for the trainer, they vote for the political, uh, major political decisions for the club. So uh, the uh, fan clubs in the Arab world, uh, do they have the same capacity to make decisions when it comes to the clubs? Thank you. Microphone, please. He's not using the microphone. Microphone, microphone please. So let us uh, start by answering this round of questions uh, in order for us not to have too many of them, and then uh, we uh, will continue with the second round of questions. So thank you. Mr. Muldi, so we have four very valid uh, uh, questions and interventions, three of them focused on violence, the symbolic and the physical aspect of it, and then we have the regulatory aspect and the legal aspect relating to the ultras. Let me start with this one. So. When it comes to the legal status of the ultras, we are not talking about legally recognized uh, associations and clubs. So uh, they reject this definition and uh, they consider themselves social uh, movements. 
and mainly they do not have to be regulated through laws. So compared to England and the legal status, the capacity of uh, um, making them involved in Russia, this is rejected based on uh, the field study that I did in Morocco. They are keen to preserve their independence despite several attempts uh, uh, to actually make them uh, partners or stakeholders, but they would like to preserve this distance in order to preserve their independence when it comes to their organization. Uh, when it comes to uh, violence, I have to talk about uh, the two main aspects of my paper, the political uh, dilemma that is relating to the uh, control of ultras in the stadia and the other uh, part is relating to uh, violence so of course violence uh, we need to take into account always that uh, there is a symbolic moral um, violence that could um, be um, at the level of instigation for violence uh, hatred and racism this is of course there However, the more dangerous aspect of it is the physical, material uh, violence that results in uh, injuries on both ends, the security forces and the fans, in addition to the damage that the uh, stadia are subject to. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, doctor. So, uh, I would like to answer uh, Mr. Uh, Muhammad. I think uh, what I presented is a very brief uh, presentation. And the paper, there's a more in-depth um, study of the relationship between the ultras and this uh, seeking of recognition and belonging which is the result of the marginalization of the youth, particularly in the popular uh, neighborhoods that are marginalized. So they seek to be recognized as active individuals in the society. They could be ultras, they could be Salafi movements, and the revolution, uh, this movement in Tunisia actually set them aside, set the ultras aside for a certain period of time, and uh, they might have uh, seen the uh, Salafi movement as this source of recognition. There was a song for Africans' winner entitled Yahyatna, so there's a detailed analysis of this song, and uh, the uh, outcome is uh, the um, stadium of the ultras moved uh, from the uh, or the belonging moved from the nation to the stadium. So this is how they uh, see it. They perceive it as their life based on the title of the song. As to the second question, I think it is a sociological uh, study or any sociological study. Uh, we need to take into account uh, the fact that the approach needs to be sound. Uh, we cannot set this aside and focus on the uh, internal aspect and the lack of objectivity and the subjectivity in this aspect. So, thank you, Dr. We uh, go back to a new round of questions. Haider. Dr. Haider, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed Naimi and Dr. Kais, for these two valuable papers. It is very important to study the ultras phenomenon, and we have another discussion about this later on. 
I hope, of course, Dr. Gharib mentioned some references. I hope that uh, one of the, the, the researchers is going to focus on the literature, the Arab literature, when it comes to the analysis of the authors. So first of all, uh, internationally, since we are talking about uh, a social form that was alien to the Arab world, uh, that was uh, uh, moved to the Arab world, so I need uh, to understand more about the explanation of the ultras phenomenon at the Arab uh, level. If we consider the ultras a social movement itself, I think the methodology to understand it is based on its relation with the uh, construct, neighboring uh, construct, to include sports. Is ultras as, uh, or create, did it create a space for expression, for organization, or did sports give something to the ultras? Also, we can talk about the relation with social movements. And if we define the ultras as social movement the way we know it in sociology, so what did other forms not give that was given by the ultras. So what is the difference between the ultras and the civil society, for instance, the generation of ultras? What is it exactly? So did they find some sort of organization and the absence or lack of other forms of organization to include the political parties, their relation with the authority? Dr. Naimi actually uh, supposed that uh, the ultras is uh, linked with the authority in the field of sports. I think it is broader than that. And we need to understand uh, in which forms of uh, authoritarian regimes we see the ultras. Is it like Egypt? Is it like Maghreb? or we're talking about the restricted authoritarian regime like Iraq, like uh, Syria, and also the other methodical, method, methodical issue. Uh, so uh, I have reservations when it comes to uh, uh, what Mr. Kais said. So the member of the ultras, what was delivered by the ultras could be delivered by belonging to a Salafi movement. But uh, the sports domain is independent and restricted. So we cannot understand a phenomenon inside this domain in comparison and competition with another movement. So if we consider this a social movement, according to my own understanding, we cannot uh, actually say it is part of the sport domain. This is an independent domain with specific relations and requirements. So if we're talking about a social movement, I think this denies uh, us any uh, definition that uh, uh, includes the ultras as part of the uh, sports domain. Thank you so much for these uh, papers. I hope they will be published. Good morning, Aisa uh, al So I have a number of remarks. I had a number of remarks. Uh, many of them were mentioned by my colleagues. I will have one question addressed to Mr. Muhammad al Naimi because in his paper, it was a general or generic presentation about ultras, but uh, the paper was supposed to highlight the structure uh, of the ultras and the hierarchy of the ultras from uh, the leadership to the bottom. And also um, the support uh, principles, supporting principles guiding the ultras. When it comes to Mr. Kais uh, Treya, uh, when it comes to Tunisian ultras, 
the African winners, uh, for instance, uh, song, uh, they describe themselves as an association. However, the M Moroccan ultras totally reject this description because association means affiliation or being subject to authority, uh, which is totally and completely rejected by the ultras because the ultras prefer to practice politics outside of the official channels uh, using so the stadiums using graffiti using using chants and songs so this symbolism becomes the means for protest and resistance when it comes to your uh, uh, mentioning of the parallelism between Salafi movements and uh, ultras. Uh, when we talk about identity, actually we are not talking about one homogenous identity. We are talking about different identities. Uh, so one individual can have several identities, like supporting one team, having a religious identity. So we do not have one or unique identity in order to group them all together. Microphone, please. The last intervention, please. So just uh, two interventions, and we will allow the panelists to answer. Thank you, Ibrahim Rabaya. I think in addition to what was mentioned by the colleagues, the ultras is a reflection of identities in the stadia, and the fan moves to becoming an ultras, and the reservoir, so to speak, is the stadium. So the fact that games were held without fans spectators in Egypt and in Tunisia actually harmed the sustainability of the ultras work as to the ultras itself they move the streets to the uh, stadium and when it was allowed to go out to the streets it was ready because it was part of a clear organized structure. So I think that what affected the ultras the most in Egypt and in Tunisia, particularly as opposed to Algeria and Morocco, is the prohibition of uh, fans uh, entering the stadia for a while. I also think that the future of ultras in several countries and uh, the relationship between ultras and political uh, authority, uh, it actually is subject to the, the, the way the political uh, authority perceives uh, sports. In the Tunisian uh, case, uh, we can talk about 248 parties and political groups, this mosaic, uh, as uh, it was rightly described. Uh, so there is a difficulty for the political authority to use the ultras at their uh, service. Thank you. Last intervention. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Hisham Kamuni. So, I have a, a, a direct question. I would like to an, ask uh, what criteria define the ultras as social movement? So uh, what gives them the credibility to identify themselves as social movement? And I would like to suggest another uh, alternative. Jodar Rozarsk uh, offered uh, definition. Why can't we talk about competing cultures, so opposing uh, cultures to uh, the violence, to the social marginalization that is faced by several individuals? So these ultras are counter cultures that use chants, songs uh, as means to uh, counter the reality. So uh, is it time to take this into account? So countercultures, so to speak. 
Thank you so much. I would like to just uh, give some uh, feedback, some remarks in order to partake in this discussion. I will start with uh, what Dr. Haider said. I disagree with you uh, when it comes to your understanding of Bourdieu because the domains of Bourdieu can be uh, interchangeable when it comes to the use of capital. You have reals, you take dollars, etc. So you invest in the industrial field. Uh, you in uh, invest in the cultural uh, field, for instance, by owning a publishing house. So this moves you from one field to another. And you can uh, be like one of the elites, uh, well-known uh, individuals. You can be a religious uh, person according to the uh, local cultures, and you can move to the political uh, domain. So uh, Bourdieu's uh, domains or fields, according to my understanding, they have conditions. And among the conditions, to have uh, capital. So you have uh, capital that you use, you enter a new field, and you have to have the criteria that allows you to be part of this domain. Uh, you can succeed, you can fail, you can be weak, and you can control the field. So. I disagree when it comes to uh, the description as uh, restricted islands. On the contrary, had Bourdieu done so, uh, it would have been a fail, because in his project he had to present a macro-sociological explanation, and he could not have described it this way. I have two remarks to move from the empirical to the uh, general theoretical and without breaking with the um, Maghreb anthropology. So you have asked questions regarding the widespread uh, ultras. Uh, so Waterbury, for instance, who talked about the division theory uh, uh, when it comes to the tribes, so moving them from the tribes, tribal areas to the urban areas, and also political parties and associations in uh, the Maghreb. Of course, uh, the theory was heavily criticized, especially when it comes to considering the ruler as a judge or uh, and this uh, this uh, aspect that was tackled by the colleagues, we can link it with the development of the Maghreb anthropology. The doctor actually talked about uh, the ultras being very uh, supportive of their teams. Gertz, who worked on Maghreb but also on Indonesia, he actually worked on the on the cockfight, so uh, we can actually use Geertz in order to study the uh, conflict between the ultras, etc., in order to have this interaction with uh, Maghreb anthropology. And I noticed that Dr. Kais returned to Pritchard, who uh, worked on Ware and Surnusia and Barca, and uh, also uh, the question is or if this division is based on uh, the relativity or the fact that people are related to each other. 
So, if we understand or if we accept this division theory, it is not based on whether people are related to each other, but it is based on other variables and we need to take them into account. This is something metaphysical uh, for Gilner. But in the ultras case, it is n definitely not. It is not stable. It is not m metaphysical. So the interaction could be this way. And one last uh, a remark regarding the projection. Um, of the religious aspect and the Salafi movement aspect onto the uh, ultras movement. I would rather have empirical uh, information regarding what happened. In 2011, there were tents in popular neighborhoods in Tunisia, all over Tunisia led by Salafi groups and in these neighborhoods they were targeting the residents who were considered or, or the or, or the or the criminals and uh, uh, the bandits basically by the residents of the neighborhood so this uh, a new uh, phenomenon was presented as capable of creating stability, peace, and security in the neighborhoods. So uh, a large group of people who would do drugs and alcohol, they joined because it was actually the refuge, because they were marginalized, uh, they were pointed at here they are now uh, becoming uh, excellent uh, religious uh, leaders in their neighborhood. Rikuba was mentioned by Dr. Uh, Kais. He led Al Kasaba sit in. I have videos actually, and it is uh, close, geographically close. And the second sit-in that ousted the government and took us to the council, so was one of the protagonists of Rikuba. So just like he was in the stadium, and the same actually melody. So what is said in the stadium, they changed the words, used different uh, lyrics and they uh, protested in front of the Prime Minister's office. So we are talking about empirical information, facts, and the issue is about how to study it in theory and uh, create new questions regarding the different theories uh, working on uh, the Maghreb, the Arab Maghreb. Thank you. I give you the floor if you want to respond to the intervention. Yes. Dr. Haider's uh, intervention actually talked about a very important uh, issue and uh, we didn't have enough time to mention it, which is actually the relationship between ultras and social movement. So it is in the paper, but we didn't have enough time to highlight it. Before answering, I would like to say, or I would like to go back to the intervention of my colleague Hisham Kamuni. So could we not consider this counterculture as replacing uh, the social movement? I think that uh, uh, we are talking about two complementary uh, concepts as to the criteria that determine the social movement. It is dependent on, uh, you know, Mathieu of uh, definition, uh, which is procedural uh, definition. It he actually says that any grouping that has a number of criteria 
or three dimensions, so uh, collectiveness or collectivity and uh, the conflict aspect and the aspiration for change. And here we can talk about the culture, uh, counter culture and also when it comes to the aft aspect of the conflict. So the first dimension in any social grouping uh, for it to be under this uh, procedural uh, definition. So we need to talk about a collective aspect and we know the difficulties and the challenges uh, that are well known by the researcher uh, when the researcher studies the move from individual action to collective action when it comes to protests the second aspect is the conflict aspect so we have the other the uh, competitor uh, we have the uh, competition and the conflict, the confrontation between the ultras, the movement, and uh, the and its antagonists. So uh, we need to uh, determine this aspect when it comes to the antagonists and also the aspect relating to the authority and the security forces accused by the ultras as adopting um, oppressive security uh, policy. Also, the, uh, what was defined by Mathieu is the dimension of aspiration for change. So when we uh, see that uh, a social movement is unhappy with, with the current situation, it uh, actually has to have collective, joint, common uh, objectives and goals. We are talking about the aspiration for change. And the ultras uh, situation, so this creates a counter culture. So what is this reality? So we are talking about the business of football as opposed to the popular football. And especially since 2011, whether in the North African countries or other Arab countries, this has been present with the keenness by the Altalas to maintain their in independence vis-a-vis -vis social movements, political parties, and civil society. We notice that in Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, that the Altalas activists take part in in uh, social movements but not as as uh, organized uh, uh, supporter associations but as individuals Isa al ghayati asked something but uh, what you asked about it's in the paper but i didn't have time and that, that is the organizational aspect. You too have researched them. They have the hierarchy, they have a pyramid, the, the capo and nuayo and, and the branches and chapters and, and they are the supporters who, 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 who need, who need to go through a period as supporters before they become members and affiliates uh, Dr. Mohammed name now Dr. Qais. I'll try to uh, respond to all the questions uh, with one 
one uh, answer and look at that from the point of view of the field work and we did and when when I carried out three interviews with the head of the sector and I accompanied them and and also uh, uh, in last May there was a match between two two the, and the capo who was the head of the association and uh, and uh, it, they have something like a tent behind the stadium or the uh, main offices of the club and they have uh, they they divide the roles and uh, there is uh, uh, work uh, for what happens during the match and what happens after the match and each division gets assigned its specific tasks the other aspect and that is the relationship between the ultras and sports in general the first ultras movement established in in uh, tunisia was in in Kashkhin, then the Africans winners, but uh, there is debate on this because Africans winners, they said they were founded in 1995 as a group of uh, supporters who accompanied the team when it went uh, away to play away matches. And then Kashkhin say they came first, but anyway, there's a debate, unsettled debate between them. And the word Kashkh means always happy, always smiling, implying that their team is always a winner. This is not an Arabic word, by the way. So far as the relationship between sport and the state, in 1972, the, uh, the two... two uh, uh, two teams, one from Sfax, and which the, 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 the Sfax team uh, lost the match and the Prime Minister was stoned, the people threw stones at him and uh, there were cars burnt. Uh, Bourguiba, the former president, took the decision to to appoint uh, a member of the ruling political ruling party to head these uh, football supporter associations i think i think the constitutional socialist party which was the ruling party appointed members from the political bureau hierarchy to head these associations. In the Mediterranean Games in 2001 and Africa chap and the, 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 the pre, when, when Tunisia won, won the African Cup, Bin Ali lifted the cup, and not the captain of the national squad. Of course, uh, in the Bin Ali period, they were either loyal to the regime politically or economically, and if they were not direct members of the ruling party. Thank you. We have a break now. But uh, just one clarification in the next uh, session, Dr. Yusuf Boandal was to he was to, to chair this the next session, but for reasons uh, outside his uh, control, Dr. Murad Dayani will kindly chair and moderate the next uh, session.